Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 398, Personalizing Decisions on PSA Screening for Men. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. As a man, I've been told most of my adult life that if I live long enough, I'll die from prostate cancer, that most men will die from prostate cancer if they live long enough. And so for the last number of years, since I was 40, I've had to have PSA screenings and digital screenings. Mm -hmm. Now I'm old enough that they tell me that they don't do digital screenings anymore because they get better than 50% error rate in the screenings. So they don't really recommend that you do that. And as of last week, the uh, United States Preventative Services Task Force, which is a federal agency that makes recommendations to doctors about what kind of tests they need to run and, and how certain medical procedures are, are processed and done, mm -hmm. has come out with a new report, a new recommendation that says that if you are between the ages of 55 and 69, when it comes time for what doctors will regularly tell you, oh, you need time for your PSA exam, let's just do a blood test and get a report, that They've downgraded it to what they call a C recommendation, which means basically the doctor needs to sit down with the man and have a conversation. Here's the risk that you'll have prostate cancer. Here's the risk that your prostate cancer will be aggressive enough that you are at risk of dying from it in your predicted lifespan. Mm -hmm. The odds for most of us are that we won't, but those exams will, they estimate, save one or two men in a thousand by doing those. So there should be a conversation. So you think, well, why shouldn't I have that? If, if just a test and gives me information, why shouldn't I just get that information? Isn't, isn't that smart? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's normally I mean, my what, first question is, well, why what not? people would ask, why, why shouldn't I get that? And yeah. the reason is that if you get the test, right. it will trigger, and, and it's high, if it, my PSA numbers are high. Yeah, if they're yeah. elevated above normal, right. then that triggers a response by your physician to then investigate why your PSA is elevated, which means usually another PSA test, which may again be high. A biopsy. A, and then a biopsy if it is if the second test Children. is high. Right. If the biopsy is done, there's a 1% chance you'll end up in the hospital. From the biopsy. From the biopsy. So one out of 100 chance you'll end up in the hospital from just the biopsy. Mm -hmm. Then that you have, if the biopsy shows pre-cancer, cancer, you'll you'll have a recommendation for either radiation or removal of the prostate. Now, prostate cancer in people over 55 generally is a very slow-growing, slow process that is not going to kill someone in their lifetime. But because the doctors found these things by, by screening, starting with the PSA, then going to the biopsy, which has risks, then going to radiation or surgery, which has even more risks, which we're going to discuss in detail, that, that whole thing is triggered by the PSA test. Right. And they feel that the side effects of the surgery are so severe and so... Uh, disabling to men that it is not it is not helpful or good for their quality of life to start the process with the PSA because it's something that's not going to kill them. So in the recommendations, one of the issues that they discuss, there are categories of men who are at higher risk. For most of us, even if we have prostate cancer at 55, 60, 65, 70, will outlive the cancer. I mean, they will die from other causes. Mm -hmm. And so the C word scares us literally to death. When somebody says, oh, you've got cancer, then automatically we think I'm, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Most of us are not. But there's a risk. So 
is there a population that's at higher risk? And there are two populations that are high, at higher risk, which is why the doctor needs to have the conversation with you. You're in a population group where there's a higher risk that your cancer is going to be more aggressive and you'll die from it as opposed to something else. Mm -hmm. So that population group is men who have uh, prostate cancer in their, in their family. family. They have a genetic precursor and, and black males. So African-American males are at a higher risk. So if you're in those two subgroups, even more importantly to have the conversation. It's all about genetics. Yes. Then you need to have a conversation. So we're worried about cancer. We want to intervene. We want to deal with this in a way that will kill the cancer, take it out of your body so you don't have it anymore. There are side effects for which there are, are massive adverse consequences if they do the two treatments to remove the cancer. And, and one is, say the word for me, a prostatectomy. A prostatectomy is, is the removal of the prostate itself, and, the, and they also do a radical if you have cancer. They take away the nodes that are around it. And many times that damages the nerves that go to the penis and, and testicles. So there's an issue there with inc both incontinence mm -hmm. and like urinary loss and not being able to hold it. Uh, and also uh, there's, there's also a problem with fecal incontinence, meaning you'll lose stool. So you can have urinary incontinence and never know when you're going to urinate. Uh, it just happens. And, and you have uh, control issues in terms of urgencies. All, all of a sudden you got to go and you got to go right now. And it may be inconvenient. You might be on an airplane. You might be in a taxi cab. You might be giving a speech. You Maybe could... walking down the street. Yes. And so you will have to deal with that for the rest of your life if I, you have that side it's, effect. It's a huge problem, and it's common. Yes. It's common when you have the radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer. It's also common when you have the other treatment, which is radiation. Right. So not only do you have fecal and urinary incontinence, Two thirds of the time, but right. you also have two -thirds, inability more than two thirds more of than the time. two thirds of the time that that procedure those procedures they, are are used to treat that cancer. Yes, and if that cancer is not going to kill you, I'm not sure you would take so that there, risk. There are three adverse issues that you will like more than likely two out of three times experience. One is sexual inability to function. You can't get an erection, and you don't have the sexual uh, performance. Yeah, the nerves are damaged during the surgery, and that's very hard to preserve the nerves when you're doing that type of surgery. And and then secondly, you will have urinary incontinence. You don't know when you're going to urinate, even when you're sleeping, uh, and urgency to go, and you're going to have fecal incontinence. And so that th those three complications are things that would cause most men to say, What's my degree of risk from, from the cancer again? Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I want to. And, and, and so typically what comes up is they recommend closely monitoring. If you've got the cancer diagnosis, then let's just keep monitoring to see how aggressive it is. Mm -hmm. If it is an aggressive cancer, then you may need to consider these side effects because It'll you're at a greater life. risk of dying from the cancer. And you'd be alive at any rate. But if you don't have the aggressive kind of cancer, leave it alone. So much so that now the recommendation that for men over 70 is that they don't get a PSA test. Right. Because now, we're, we're, we're worried right. about overreaction, overtreatment, adverse consequences. Yeah, too much surgery. Yeah. Or radiation. Yeah, or so, radiation. So this is, this is close to your heart because you're a guy. Yeah. But absolutely. it's also close to the hearts of the women who are married to the guys <laughs> because that this whole process is – after the surgery is almost as worrisome as having a cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Not being able to rehabilitate yourself back to your normal self. Now, now there are people who go through the surgery and are fine. Well, but the a conversation. A third of the time, they'll be fine. But two thirds of the time, which is not a good risk, they will not be fine. And they will, they and will have these side They'll not be fine in ways effects. that are really going to be uncomfortable and problematic for their partners. Which will change their lives and their partner's lives. Exactly. I, I would not make this decision. I'm having this conversation with my doctor because I'm of the age group where they need to have the conversation. Then I wouldn't make the decision without pulling my wife in and saying, let's all talk about this because right. she needs to know 
I mean, she's going to panic and say, oh, my God, you're going to die. But right. then she's going to say, wait a minute, if you don't die, what are we going to be living with? Mm-hmm. And is that a reasonable risk? Is that something that we ought to do? It would, it would stop travel. In general, most yeah. people would not be able to travel or even go oh, to work. 15-hour plane flight somewhere? Well, if, even a three-hour plane flight might be a problem. Could be a problem. And yeah. so this is... These are real issues that really change your life. And it doesn't mean that everybody flies by plane, but I mean, a bus, a car. Driving this a car. Is, if this you're driving is across issue. Kansas. Yeah. And there's no town for 100 miles. You better have some toilet paper in your in your trunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, all I have to say. And, and we don't I mean, mean to be disrespectful. It's, it's, is, it's, a, it's hard to talk about this without trying to have some levity because it's so ugly and nasty. And consequential. And, and one we want to help reasons, you make the right decision. Well, we do. Without, I mean, you'll hear, oh, you need to have this surgery because, or you need to have this tested, even if you're at low risk, because that's been done forever. We've been doing this forever. And we've been doing a lot of surgeries that may or may not have been necessary. Yeah. But this this committee was given the task of reviewing all of the research and deciding whether it's worse to have the surgery or better, is it going to save your life or is it going to ruin your life? Right. And this is what they came up with. So standard of care has been that men of a given age get a PSA test and a digital exam for years. Now they've dropped off the digital exam. Most doctors don't do it anymore. It's not standard of care. Because but it they doesn't still do tell- the PSA. Only fifty percent of the time was it correct, so 50, it's a it's a crapshoot, really. Yeah, exactly. It's, you could easily just make the decision one way or another without doing the exam. So, so there are two additional pieces of information that we want to give you. One is that as men age, their PSA count goes up marginally, tenth of a percent, two tenths of a percent, typically. Mm-hmm. So, sometimes these guys will get a PSA, and their doctor will say, "Oh, you went from a four to a four point five. And now we need to do That's biopsy. too big a jump. Yeah. That's too big a jump because it went up. Yeah. And so then you have the issue about the biopsy. And the biopsy itself, one in three guys are going to be in the hospital with an after issue from the biopsy. Or then they decide to overtreat the prostate uh, with radiation or with surgery. So your PSA number is going to go up. If you are like me, if you're a man who's getting hormone replacement therapy and getting testosterone replacement, then the testosterone also, when you begin to take it, your PSA number will spike, but then it will come back down. If your regular physician does not know that, when they see that your number has spiked, when they do the regularly projected test, they're going to panic and say, well, wait, we've got to stop the hormone replacement because your prostate's higher, which means you're likely to have prostate cancer, which means you're going to have to have all these surgeries. So we want you to know to go slow about that. But the issue and the reason that, one of the primary reasons that the the, uh, task force has made this recommendation is because people overreact and overtreat when it's not critically necessary. Right. And and the other thing in PSA testing is there are many variables. Yeah. And we always, if we get a high PSA with our patients when we were testing them, we would say, okay. No sex for three days, no working out for three days, no hot right. baths, no hot tubs, uh, nothing strenuous. Don't, so you don't ride get your a bike false high. Because all of those things give you a falsely high PSA. And if you're on allopurinol for gout, that always gives you a high PSA. So you that it is not it is not a test that can be used to evaluate your prostate if you're on allopurinol or if you have if you have for just gout. Had sex or worked or out. Or if you just had sex or you just worked out, then all of those tests are going to be elevated, and you have to go back without those things interfering to get a true test. But I'm not sure that everybody tells their patients that. No. I, I know that many of our patients will say, well, I get a digital exam. This is a year right. ago or so. I get a digital exam from my doctor, which means a rectal exam. And then he sends me downstairs to get my PSA drawn, well, and but, I which is wondered. the wrong order. <laughs> you should get your PSA first. Yeah, because not, that'll, that'll that will cause it stimulate to spike. That yes. will stimulate the PSA test. So I'm not sure if he d- didn't know. I mean, maybe because I started taking care of aging men late in the game, I had to learn all this stuff. And so I learned the different reasons a PSA could be falsely elevated. So I've always wondered 
how does a physician who has a caseload of 2,000 people, men, who does digital exams, remember the tactile sensation? They don't. They describe it in a note. Oh, they, they, they describe make a note. it in spongy, a note. Soft, spongy, hard, soft, big, hard has a has an area on the right that feels okay. uh, firm, or you know. So they're so then they're looking at their computer and doing what they. Well, do. they look at it before they examine you to see if that's still there. Okay. It's just like I remember the size of a uterus. So I, you know. Yeah, no, I, I guess I, you do if it's we what do you do. Ex- we do exams by by doing a digital exam on a female through the vagina and the abdomen, and so right. you feel the uterus and the ovaries doing thousands of those tens of thousands of those in your lifetime gives you the ability to actually feel the ovaries and right. feel the size right. the consistency the size of the uterus the consistency and you remember patients and you write or you it write down the notes down okay and so then when i see the patient and i write and i look at my note sure. i remember what it felt like okay so it does yeah. it triggers that memory well one of the things that we say on all of our podcasts is that dr moppin's office is known for the level of currency in terms of research that they do. They try to stay on top of new ways of thinking and new ways of practicing in medical profession. And over six months ago, they stopped requiring PSA tests for men who were coming in for an evaluation about testosterone mm-hmm. replacement because of these concerns. So they're, they're ahead of the curve by about six months in terms of this task force now issuing its final recommendations. And the, uh, it, it was, the recommendation was made on May the 11th, 2018. Mm-hmm. So this is now May the 15th. So just a week ago, they've come down. And since then, the uh, AAFP, the American Association of Family Practitioners, has sent out this news broadcast to family practitioners saying, alert, this is now what we think should be the standard of care. So those physicians will begin to put the message out into the community, oh, we don't do that anymore, and here's why. But there's a, a, a lag time mm-hmm. for other doctors, especially older doctors who've been doing this for years. And may not, who read, may not stay read on top their of their email yes. messages, so yeah. they may not get it from So there. you should know, so that you can say to your doctor, well, wait a minute, let, let's have this conversation mm-hmm. before we have this test. Or if you have the test and they come back and there's a concern, oh, your numbers are up two-tenths of a percent mm-hmm. or a half or whatever it might be, now we need to do something radically because you're in trouble. You might be, and it needs to be checked out. But they need to have that conversation with you. You need to make a decision based on the risk factors involved. And if you're, mm-hmm. if you're in a relationship with somebody, they need to be a part of the discussion about the side effects because they're pretty substantial. And pretty statistically high. We want to help protect you. Yes. And we want you to make the right decisions. So talk to your doctor about this. Give them a little lag lead time to get this information um, to them through their specialty groups. Like the urologist will have this sent to them through their specialty group. And, and they will then read it and use their experience as to whether they agree with this or not. But... You still have you still have an input to them. Right. You can say, "I don't want to have this test done," or "Yes, I want to have it done, even though I'm over seventy. Yes, that's it's it's. You always have to sign consent. Yeah, you're you're the you're the patient, yeah. and you should have your beliefs and your thoughts on the subject uh, heard and considered when uh, medical decision making is made. So we thank you for listening to us today. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.